Hi, I am Tom Christensen of Neurochrome. In this video, I will show you how to make a high-end headphone amplifier using the Neurochrome HP22 and the Neurochrome preamp power supply. I will show you how to mount these in a pre-made chassis from a company named Hammond. Um, the chassis comes without any of the cutouts that you need for connectors and switches and mounting the circuit boards. So the focus on this video will be how to machine the chassis to accommodate these circuit boards. I'm putting this video together because it's my impression that a lot of DIY audio enthusiasts are having a bit of trouble with the chassis work. And it's really not that hard once you've done it once or when you, once you've been shown once. So that's my goal for this video. So by the end, you should be able to make um, cutouts in sheet metal aluminum ranging from like two, two and a half millimeters in diameter up to 24 millimeters in diameter. Uh, including square cutouts for the mains inlet on this power supply. The Neurochrome HP22 is a very simple board. It sits on top of this TI evaluation module for the OPA1622, and it requires very few tools to assemble. It is one of my simplest circuits available. You will need some basic tools like pliers, side cutters, and wire strippers, and you'll need a small screwdriver flat blade for the terminal blocks. And that's pretty much it. It's intended to sit like it does right here, um, just on the rubber feet that's on the bottom of the board, and you can power it with a pair of nine volt batteries. Um, but it's a little more fun to have you know, an amplifier in a chassis powered by mains voltage. Um, and also, I think that's a really nice and self-contained DIY audio product or project. So that's why I'm putting this video together. To assemble the board in the chassis, you need a screwdriver, uh, Phillips, and probably some others that I haven't shown here. Um, I haven't actually cracked the chassis open to see what screws are in it. You'll need some adjustable wrenches. A nut driver can be handy, but a wrench works just as well. And you'll also need a uh, Allen key of some dimension. In my case, I'm going to color a little bit outside of the lines and go with a very nice aluminum um, volume knob from a company called Modu Shop out of Italy. And that takes a two millimeter Allen key. So uh, if you use a different volume knob, you need to make sure that you have the tool to put it on. This is the chassis that I'll be using for this build. It comes in this very nice Neurochrome blue, or maybe it's Hammond blue, it's made by Hammond anyway. Um, and it's also built in red and black and probably clear, so there are some options for you to choose from if you don't like blue. But since blue is my company color, I figured I would try that. And the only drawback of this chassis that I can find is that the thickness of the front and rear panels is pretty small. So these are about, I think, a millimeter thick, if I recall correctly. And it can be a bit tricky to drill, especially large diameter holes in thin sheet metal. And for drilling the holes, I prefer to use drill bits, at least for the smaller diameter. I have a drill index here that covers everything from one millimeter to 13 millimeters in half millimeter steps. If you prefer to work, to work in inches, that's fine. Just make sure you do, do the conversion right. So I tend to work in sheet metal up to about five millimeters. And once I'm above that point, I switch to one of these stepped drills. And the advantage of these step drills is that it's a very controlled way of making a large diameter hole. Basically, what you do is you drive this through a pilot hole that's five millimeters in diameter, and you work your way up each step until you reach the desired diameter. So that way, with this drill here, which is one of these fancy titanium nitride coated ones by Irwin, I can get up to 35 millimeters in diameter. With this more generic one here, it's actually an, an electrician's knockout drill. So it's specified in knockout sizes. And US stuffs being the way it is, that means that if you drill a half inch knockout, you're not gonna get a half inch diameter hole, but at least a three, three quarter inch knockout is larger than a half inch, unlike wire sizes, for example. Anyway, rant over. 
To get the holes in the right spot, we need them to make a mark with a center punch. That's this guy here. It has a sharp end like that, or a pointy end. So don't confuse that with a nail set. Nail set is this guy. We won't be using the nail set for this project. I'm not planning to hammer anything into this, uh, but I'm just bringing it out to show the difference between it and the center punch. The nail set has a blunt end and it's intended for driving finishing nails into wood. So not applicable here. And to smack the center punch, we'll use a small hammer. And also I'll be making a rectangular opening in this box for the mains inlet. So to clean that up and to get the edge edges nice and straight, I'll need some files. I have one here that's cross cut, that's useful for fast material removal. And then I have one that's just straight cut or regular, and that is useful for getting a smooth surface finish. This is what it looks like once you get the chassis unpacked. The chassis front and rear panel are held together with the rest of the chassis using these plastic plugs. They just come out by prying underneath with a fingernail and that allows you to take the whole thing apart here. So now we have the front and rear panel, we have the two bezels that go on the front and the rear, we have the bottom piece, the top piece, a bag full of screws that are Phillips head by the way, and also some stick-on feet that you can put on the bottom of the chassis. So all that we need to do now is to drill the holes in the chassis. And for that, I have made available these handy um, drill templates. You can find them in the resources section of the HP 22 product page. And at the bottom of these drill templates, you will find this uh, scale indicator. I've made it both in inches and in millimeters so that you can check with a ruler to make sure that you have printed these at the correct scale. So from start to finish, we get exactly 100 millimeters on the 100 millimeter scale or in inches, four inches. Ta-da, exactly like it should be. This should just work if you print at 100% uh, magnification, but I highly recommend like at, that you do what I just did and check that the dimensions are correct before you start punching holes in the chassis. So now all I have to do is to cut out this drill template, put it on the bottom and cut out the ones for the front and rear panels, stick them to the respective panels, and I'm ready to mark the panels with the center punch. Once you have the templates applied to the front and the rear panel, I recommend that you check the alignment of the template relative to the panel. And you can do that just by looking through, um, holding the panel up against the light and looking through the holes, because you should be able to see the outline that's drawn on the template align perfectly with the hole um, in the panel itself. And once you're confident that you have the templates in the right spot, it's time to mark the hole locations. And what you do is you grab your center punch and you place the point on the punch right at the center of the crosshair on the drill marks and you just tap. Only tap once um, and you don't need to smack it. All you need to do is make a little indentation in the panel where the drill bit will center. That's all that's required. So now all I have to do is continue for the remaining uh, punch marks and I'm ready to drill the front and the rear panel. And now for the bottom panel. The alignment of the template relative to the panel is not as critical for the bottom as long as you make sure that the front and the rear of the template align up with the edges of the panel itself. Then all you have to do is punch those five holes and, or rather locations for those five holes, and you're good to go. Like that. Now what I like to do is to take the templates off and mark the hole locations with a permanent marker. And I also write the diameter that the hole is supposed to be on the panel itself 
just makes my life easier when I'm in the machine shop drilling a few holes. Welcome to my metal workshop, also known as my garage. Uh, I apologize, it's going to be a little bit of background noise. That's one of my neighbors is uh, doing a little bit of home renovation, so we're going to he hear a little bit of banging and clanging, but such is life. Um, so this is the front panel of the chassis that we're going to be working on. And it will need holes ranging in diameter from two and a half millimeters up to 24 millimeters. Whenever you drill a hole into, well, basically anything, you really want to start with a pilot hole. And that would be a hole of a very small diameter. And that very small hole will help guide the larger drill bits so that they don't uh, skate around on the, or wander on the panel itself. Because if, a pan, uh, if the drill bit starts to wander, it'll make, you know, gouge marks in the panel and that makes for a pretty bad day. So let's not do that. So I like to start, since the, the lowest diameter or smallest diameter is two and a half millimeters, I prefer to start with a two millimeter drill bit. And I'm going to drill all the holes with that. And then I'm going to work up to two and a half. Um, the next size up is 3.3 millimeters. And uh, I can go directly from two and a half to 3.3. Then I'll have to go up to seven and a half and I'm going to use progressively larger drill bits for that. And then 24 and 16 millimeters. And for those, I will need the step drill bits like I talked about earlier. But before we get cracking here, uh, I like to touch on a couple of things. I prefer to drill holes using a drill press and drill presses are actually not terribly expensive. Um, and it is by far the tool I use the most. Uh, this is a Jet JDP-12. I paid about 300 bucks for it. Um, granted, that was probably 15 years ago. Um, you can use a hand drill, but um, the drill press has the advantage that all the holes will be perpendicular to the surface that you're working on. So it just, it just makes life easier. Um, if you are using a hand drill, you definitely want to make sure that you clamp the workpiece to some rigid surface like a workbench um, so that you can hold the drill, you know, both hands and, and drill like that. Um, another tip here is always use some sort of underlayment or some sort of um, a piece of wood or something to catch the drill bit. Um, you can drill, as long as you don't drill into the table, you can drill through this center hole in the middle. But I prefer to have, um, in this case, it's just a piece of MDF that I use as an uh, underlayment. And the other thing we need to talk about is a bit of shop safety. Now, I'm not a machinist, so I'm not an expert on these things. Don't sue me if you hurt yourself. You do it this entirely on your own risk. But you really do want to make sure that you wear eye protection. And that looks like this. Um, these are not eye protection, but I can't see without these and wearing both at the same time, I have yet to find a solution that works well. So unfortunately, this is gonna be a little bit of do as I say, not as I do, because I will be running the risk and not using proper eye protection. Um, the other thing that tend to catch people in the machine shop is stuff like this. Literally, catch. If this catches on a drill bit that's spinning, that's going to suck your face right into the drill and that's going to make for a really, really bad day. So these has to come off. Tie them on the back or tuck them in or cut them off. Make sure that they don't get in the way. Same with long sleeves. So either roll up the sleeves or just take the shirt off. Better safe than sorry, if the sleeve catches on the drill bit, you're gonna have a bad day. So luckily for me, today happens to be a relatively mild day in Calgary, at least by late September standards. So I'm just gonna work short sleeve and that works out. So one thing that you wanna make sure to do when you cut into aluminum is that you wanna use some cutting fluid. The stuff that I like to use is this A9 aluminum cutting fluid that you can find at well-assorted hardware stores. Um, you kind of want to go to sort of an industrial supply place. Um, I think I bought this at Tacoma Screw back when I lived in Seattle. So look them up online and maybe find something similar in your local area. 
Um, the reason for this is that the tools cut much better um, and the uh, chips uh, break off much better when you use the cutting fluid. You can use uh, denatured alcohol and I've e even heard uh, kerosene being used. You can also use water, but water has the major drawback that it causes your tools to rust, so I can't recommend that. But I have in the past used um, denatured alcohol, which at least in North America is marketed as MEK, M-E-K. Um, so there's that. So without further ado, let's drill some holes in this panel. Here I have the workpiece set up for you. This is the front panel. I have a drop of the A9 cutting fluid applied and I'm ready to go. So once I start up this drill press, it'll go at about 2,000, 2,200 RPM, which is as fast as it can go. And I will be using this two millimeter drill bit to make this hole. So let's get cracking. Like that. So as you probably noticed, I went down a little bit, allowed the chip to come up to about here on the drill bit. Then I released pressure a little bit and then drilled some more and used that procedure to drill all the way through. You can drill all the way through in one shot, but that tends to give these long chips that come off the drill bit and sometimes they will end up on the front panel and scratching it uh, and they can cut your hands and all sorts of nastiness. So I prefer to keep the chips a bit short by easing off on the drill every now and then. So now I just need to do the same for the rest of these holes and I'm ready to progress to the next larger hole size. So there you have it. Now all these holes are two millimeters. I have the next drill bit size going. That's two and a half millimeters. This hole needs to be two and a half millimeters. I could probably drill at least the 3.3 millimeter holes with the two millimeter pilot hole, but I'm just gonna drill all the holes at two and a half. That just makes life easier and then I don't have to think as much and less thinking is good. So let's get cracking. Like that. Now the machinists out there, the professional machinists, uh, are probably going, ah, you should clamp the workpiece. And that is entirely true, I should. And my drill press even has these uh, T-slots that could fit a clamp. Um, but this is another do as I say, not as I do. Uh, <laughs> I generally find that with the smaller drill bit sizes, uh, the drill tends to break rather than to catch. So I'm not overly worried about it. Um, but the risk of not clamping the workpiece is that the drill will catch and then it's gonna send that, uh, that workpiece spinning. And if the piece has sharp edges, you're gonna end up cutting your fingers and that makes for a bad day. So the best approach really is to clamp it. Um, follow at your own risk. But anyway, I now have the 3.3 millimeter holes drilled. Um, so now I'm gonna work my way up to the larger diameter so that I can get a uh, 24 millimeter here and a seven and a half millimeter in the middle for the volume control and a 16 millimeter over here. So since my uh, stepped drill starts at five millimeters, I need to work my way up to five. Uh, I could go directly from 3.3 millimeters to five millimeters, but like I, like I mentioned earlier, I prefer to work in smaller steps. Um, so I will drill to four and then uh, five millimeters um, for the seven and a half for the volume control, I will most likely drill in half millimeter or one millimeter increments until I get to 7.5. And then for the um, power switch, the 16 millimeter hole, I will drill to five millimeters and use the stepped drill bit. So I will do that and catch up with you once I get to the stepped drill bit. So now we're ready to go with the stepped drill bit. 
And I know it seems like I'm belaboring the point about constantly stepping up the dr drill sizes and so on, but I just want to mention that for the volume control hole that needed to be seven and a half millimeters, I ended up going from five to six to seven and a half, and that seemed to work just fine. Uh, of course, it's then when I put this tapered bit in that I realized, oh, that has a seven and a half as well. Isn't that convenient? So it would actually have been better to, to use this drill bit because it's, like I mentioned earlier, a more controlled process. So this time around, you'll notice that I have the workpiece clamped like I'm supposed to. Uh, I also have the drill press set for the lowest speed that it'll go. And that's about uh, 560 RPM. And I do that because this drill bit puts a lot of torque. I mean, because of its diameter and because of the gear ratio in the um, uh, drill press, this can really put a lot of torque into the workpiece and it will send it spinning. So clamp it down. Uh, as you can also see, I have replaced the MDF with, in my case, a couple of pieces of uh, cedar deck board that I happen to have laying around. And I started out by drilling a deep hole, uh, probably up to about here, 30 millimeters or so. Uh, just plunge through uh, to get, to make sure that there's an opening for this drill bit to dig into as I'm digging through this or drilling through this uh, front panel. So I have it all lined up. All I have to do is add the cutting fluid and let's get up to 16 millimeters. So hopefully this time around I'll get a shot for you where my hands are in the way. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's add a little bit of this cutting fluid and also to the drill bit itself. So I'm just counting the number of steps that I need to go here. So one, two, three, fourth step is 16 millimeters. I might stop a little bit uh, before that to double check, but let's keep going. Pretty sure this is the second to last step, but let's just double check. Oh uh, no, two more actually. Well, now it's a good time to add a little bit of cutting fluid. Ta-da! So this should be 16 millimeters. And now for the moment of truth. Let's see if this hole is indeed 16 millimeters. Be careful not to scratch the front panel by swiping the shavings off there. So then the slide caliber, check. Yep. 16 millimeters. Ta-da! <laughs> I love it when it's turned out like, like, like that. So now we need the 24 millimeters for the uh, output connector. And if I recall correctly, this uh, hole saw has a drill bit in it that is, it's either five or six millimeters in diameter. So let's just measure that. Oh, it's five, perfect. So, the five millimeter hole I have already will match perfectly with this. All I have to, to do is to, you know, bore through and ta-da, now there should be 24 millimeters. So let's do that. Alrighty then. So I have the workpiece set up here. And as you can see, I have the 24 millimeter hole saw in the drill press that's set up for the lowest speed it'll go, which is that about 560, 550 RPM. Uh, the workplace is clamped. Um, and with a block of cedar underneath. And all I have to do at this point is to add some cutting fluid. And hopefully we can get some on the panel as well. And start, start drilling. <laughs>
Yep. Just like that, this will pop out. And now we have a 24 millimeter hole. Now it is time for the bottom piece and the rear panel. I'm not gonna bore you with each and every step because it's basically the same as the front panel. The main differences are obviously hole, lo hole locations and diameters. In the bottom piece, we need to drill five 3.3 millimeter holes and in the uh, rear panel, it's a little more complicated, but it's hole, holes ranging from 3.3 up to 10 millimeters. Uh, so for the 10 millimeters, I'll use the stepped drill bit, which has a 10 millimeter step on it. And uh, for the rest, I'll just work my way up, um, you know, little by little, as I did with the front panel. So let me get cracking and I'll catch up with you when I have all these holes drilled. So I now have all the holes drilled in the rear panel. And before this work is complete though, I would like to deburr the holes because burrs are these little sharp pieces of metal that you often leave behind when you drill through metal. Um, and it's not a good practice to leave them behind because the next person who handles this work piece is gonna get sliced with it. Um, so, one way to remove the burrs is to use a larger drill bit. So this is an eight millimeter and you just insert it into the, one of the smaller holes and turn it. And that leaves a nice and smooth uh, surface here. If you have a drill press, there's an even easier way. And that is to use a countersink. And I have the drill press set up for the slowest speed possible and just turn it on and then touch each hole to the countersink. Like that, now the panel is deburred. The other thing that needs to happen to this panel is that I need to make a hole for this mains inlet. Um, the back of this is not round. It is hexagon, although not a very even one, and the manufacturer suggests a uh, rectangular cutout where the corners have a uh, two and a half millimeter radius. So the four five millimeter holes in the back of this panel need to be connected so that this rectangular piece between the holes can be cut out and then the connector will drop right in. So there are a couple of different ways that one can make a rectangular hole in a panel without having a rectangular punch. And one such way is to drill a hole in each corner and use a coping saw. And that tends to work pretty well as long as you can find a blade that has, uh, that's fine enough. And this unfortunately is not one such blade. This is intended for wood. It can probably cut aluminum, but the, it's like 16 teeth per inch, so it's pretty rough. And that's not, the, that's not my preferred way to go. So I tried to find a final blade that couldn't, so I'm gonna show you another way. And this other way I actually learned at some point in my childhood and have used it since, and it works just fine. And that is to drill a series of holes all the way along the perimeter of the rectangle that you want to cut. That's gonna leave the piece in the middle sort of floating, and you can either cut the web with a pair of uh, side cutters, or sometimes the piece simply falls out. So then you're left with a pretty rough opening but that's pretty easy to fix with a file. So what I'll do with this panel is first I'll clean off the cutting fluid uh, with some rubbing alcohol, and then I will draw the rectangle. And once I reach that point, I'll catch back up with you. So I use the square and a permanent marker to draw this outline. Now all I need to do is drill a series of holes along the inside of the perimeter and the middle piece can be popped out. 
All right, so I have the drill press set up with a five and a half millimeter drill bit. The reason I use five and a half, I was actually going for five, but uh, one, the diameter is not critical, and two, my five and a half millimeter drill bit appears to be straighter than my five millimeter drill bit. So that would probably work a little bit better. I'm not gonna bother with uh, punch marks. I'm not looking for the ultimate precision here. As long as the edge of the drill bit stays within that outline, all is well. I will use some cutting fluid though. So I'll just put that on. And I have the drill press set for about 1200 RPM. I like to go a little bit slower with the medium sized drill bits here. So let's get cracking. Now, this piece in the middle, eh, it's not quite ready to fall out, but I'm sure that with a pair of side cutters, you can cut the remaining bits that weren't cut by the drill bit. And persuade it to pop out. This is thankfully soft aluminum. Don't do this with steel, it'll ruin your pliers or your end cutters. Uh, but aluminum is nice and soft so the pliers won't be damaged. And now we have a hmm, crappy rectangular hole, <laughs> but it'll get cleaned up in a moment with a file. So to clean up this rectangular hole, we need some files. And I find it easiest to work with the workpiece clamped in a vise. Uh, as you can tell, I don't use the vise all that often. That's why it's mounted on a piece of pine that I just uh, clamped to the workbench. That way I can get it out of the way when I don't use it. So one thing to note about vices is that their jaws tend to be pretty jagged. After all, they're intended for holding stuff. And those rough um, edges there will dig into the front panel and cause damage, or into the rear panel in this case. So what I do is I use a pair of uh, aluminum angles that were scrap left over, and I just place them in the jaws of the vise and clamp the workpiece in the vise. Like that. And then I start with the cross cut file. Now, the trick with filing is that you want to go slow and apply some pressure. So, like that. Um, I would normally stand on the other side, but then you can't see. <laughs> so, let me see if I can get a better shot for you. So, like this. You just keep going until you filed all the way down to that outline. And let's do that.
like that. And now I like to make the surface a bit smoother by using a regular file. What I just used was a cross cut one. So, ooh. like that, nice and smooth. And now I'll just repeat for the remaining three sides. Now all that's left to do is to get the panel out of the vise, get the dust off, and see if the mains connector will fit. And wouldn't you know, it does. There's a little bit of play, maybe, maybe about a millimeter in each direction. So this is about perfect. That's exactly what I wanted, and when I hold it such that the mounting holes are aligned between the connector and the panel, None of the cutout is showing, so this is pretty much perfect. Now let's wrap up this project. Here we have all the parts that need to go in the chassis. Basically, we have the OPA 1622 eval board from Texas Instruments that comes pre-assembled. That is part of the Neurochrome HP22 project. These two together form the HP22 headphone amplifier. In this project, I'm going to power it with the Neurochrome preamp power supply. That is a switching power supply. It takes universal mains input so it can be used in Europe, it can be used in North America, Japan, everywhere in the world. And that comes fully assembled from Neurochrome. So that's pretty easy. Then we need a mains inlet for the power supply. We need a fuse for the mains inlet and a grounding lug, two RCA connectors, a power switch. Note that the power switch comes with this O-ring that needs to be applied to the power switch before you insert it into the front panel of the headphone amp. And then the output connector right here, which is a Neutrix 6.35 milliliter um, TRS jack. The mounting hardware here is nine M3 by six millimeter machine screws. Eight of them go with these standoffs. They are M3 by 10 millimeters long. These you get from Mauser. Um, on the Mauser bill of materials, I have also specified some screws, but they look a little bit different than these. So four of the screws will attach each of these to the bottom of the chassis. The other four will attach the power supply to the standoffs. The final screw of these kinds will attach the mounting lug to the chassis using one of the hex nuts. That leaves four hex nuts for the M3 by six millimeter flat head machine screws that you will use with the mains inlet and with the output connector. If you cannot find uh, M3 by six flat head, order four more of the M3 by six from Mauser in black and um, that will be that will be okay, uh, but flat heads are preferred. In addition, you'll need some cable uh, for connecting the input. I use this fancy microphone cable from uh, Canar, and I use it because I have it. You could probably probably use like a twisted pair uh, wires out of an Ethernet cable, or just take two 20 gauge wires and twist them together. Uh, that would be just fine for the input for wiring up the power supply both to the boards themselves and to the power switch. I use some 20 gauge wire in various colors that I happen to have handy. If you have made it this far in the project, you probably don't need a whole lot of instructions for how to put this together. So I'm going to fly through it. Um, these build videos of mine tend to approach the length of a Hollywood movie and I'm not sure they're as exciting to watch. So um, I'm going to make it pretty short and just focus on sort of the quirks or pitfalls that you might run into when you're putting this together, things that you need to keep in mind or pay extra attention to. For the rest, I'm going to assume that, you know, you can turn a screwdriver and figure out which part goes where. The amp is coming together pretty well at this point. The bottom came, came together pretty easily. The 
output connector. I have it mounted in the front panel. Uh, there's a little bit of swap, so make sure that the edges of the connector are parallel to the edges of the panel, just so it doesn't look all crooked. And then I'm now onto the rear panel. And the mains connector is pretty self-explanatory. I popped the fuse in and I installed it so that the writing is correct side up when the panel is installed in the chassis. And now I'm at the RCA connector where I'm finding the first little hurdle. And if you look at the RCA connector, it comes with all this hardware. It comes with two nuts, a solder lug, a flat washer that's flat on both sides, and a shoulder washer that's flat on one side and has a little bit of a step on the inside. That little step needs to go into the hole itself and it needs to center correctly so that it sits, the washer will sit completely flat against the panel and then you use the other washer, the washer that's flat on both sides on the inside uh, it's keyed, so you got to put it on just the right way. Then install the nut. And let's get that one tightened until it's nice and snug. Then put on the solder lug and the last nut there. And just tighten that up nice and snug. As I mentioned earlier, the next point of note is with the power switch. That has an O-ring and that needs to get draped over the power switch. So let's get it over all the pins here. Oh, come on. There. And just drape that and roll it all the way to the front. Now you're ready to pop that into the front panel. And just because I'm a geek, I, I line the, or a little detail oriented, I guess, I align the terminals on the switch so that it looks pretty on the inside. That's obviously not necessary, but it's just something I do. And then snug that up. So now we have a front panel. And then finally, the HP 22 comes as these two boards in the sandwich. Uh, the volume knob that I specify, specify as part of the HP22 project is just something I found that was quick and easy. And I won't be using it in this project or in this build. So, but I will be using the mounting hardware on the potentiometer itself. But you will notice that once you put the board onto the front panel, then it doesn't really fit. And that is because this uh, output connector on the TI evaluation board protrudes over the edge of the board. So either this connector will need to be removed, which mm, is probably not too, too difficult, but it might require a hot air tool, uh, or this collar uh, can just be chopped off and chopping off sounds pretty easy. So let's just do that For hacking this connector. I'm thinking to use these uh, Side cutting pliers and I'm just gonna Well, that was easy eh, It's a little rough so I might just touch it with a file I think that's actually good enough. So now we need to put the stack back together. Like that. And mount it on the front panel. And that is accomplished with the hardware that came with the potentiometer. Like that. And let me just double check something because I'm pretty sure that the feet that are on the 
eval board are just a touch too tall. Yeah, they are just, it's like half a millimeter that they stick up. And that's not really up to my quality standards. So I'm going to take these, these uh, feet off and replace them with some other feet. And hopefully that'll make everything fit in the chassis. Now, just to be clear, it's not just because of my high quality standards that I choose to replace the feet on the evaluation board. Because, quite frankly, I mean, they're going to be inside, so why would anybody care? But the issue with the feet that come with the board, at least the one that I bought, is that they're a little bit too tall, so they push up the front panel so that the screws that hold the front panel to the bottom of the case won't align properly. And that's a problem. So you could of course say, well, why didn't you just move the whole the front panel for the volume control up a little bit, but then the volume control isn't centered on the, on the front panel. And I thought that would look kind of goofy. So I just chose to replace the feet. And at the time I ordered, I could get four of these feet um, from Mauser for not very much money. But unfortunately, it appears that since then, um, they have started to only sell them in sheets. And I think they come in sheets of like 72 or something like that. Um, they're not all that expensive. We might be talking like five, ten dollars worth of feet. So um, you can order them and have some left. I do recommend that you use uh, feet on this board just because there are some components mounted on the bottom and also there are some connector pins that poke through. So just in case the board should ever rattle or, or slide down a little bit, um, the feet will prevent these points from contacting the chassis. So I'll just put these feet on and then we can move on here. The next hurdle is the wiring for the power switch and the output connector. It's obviously important to get those right, so let's just walk through that real quick. On the power switch, you'll notice that two of the pins are gold. Those are for the switch itself, and you'll notice that one pin is labeled G2.8V-, the other one is labeled R1.8V+. I don't know why they're labeled plus and minus because the one that's marked R 1.8 plus, that is the anode or positive connection for the red LED inside this power switch. The one terminal that's marked G 2.8 V minus is the positive or anode terminal of the green LED inside this power switch. So it seems to be a typo. Um, Anyway, I will connect a red wire to the terminal that's marked R1.8B+, and a green wire to the terminal that's marked uh, G2.8V-, and brown wires to the switch itself. So that should allow you to follow through on the wiring. And on the output connector, you will find that one terminal is marked GR for ground, so that is the sleeve connection. One connection is marked RI for ring, and that is the right, ring is right connection. And then the final connection here is marked TIP for the tip of the jack, and the TIP is the left channel. So that should allow you to wire it up correctly to the uh, HP 22. On the HP 22 itself you'll see that when you build it according to the build of materials you will actually have these RCA jacks and we won't be using them in this build. I don't know if you might be able to squeeze in like a courtesy interconnect or something into them uh, when the power supply is there. If you can, great for you. You can just use that and wire that to the two RCA inputs. Uh, if not, then I suggest that you solder wire onto the bottom of the circuit board, or uh, if you're building from scratch, then just don't mount this connector and solder the wire directly into the board. That would be way easier. The next hurdle is the output connections to the amp. And the reason that's a hurdle is because I just dropped up that output connector. And thankfully, TI has provided these uh, handy little probe points on their evaluation board. And if you just pre-tin them, uh, it's pretty easy to solder a piece of wire onto them. And as you can see, I have two soldered already. And I'm just going to finish up the third and 
we have an output connection. So I know I said earlier that I wanted to use this canard uh, microphone cable, but I find it to be a little bit stiff to work with inside this pretty small chassis. And I'm a bit concerned that there's going to be too much strain on the wires that are attached, especially to the circuit board. And I don't want them to come loose or fall off. So I'm actually going to go with twisted pair. I'm also a little bit curious to see if that changes the performance in any way. I mean, a twisted pair might pick up a little bit more hum or something. It shouldn't, because actually the shield in a shielded cable doesn't do much uh, for mains hum. It's more for uh, capacitive coupling, but we'll see. And one trick with uh, making a twisted pair is to you know start with a pair of wires and use a power drill and tie a knot at the end of the wire. Put the drill in forward. And oh, let's see. There. And type the chart down. It does need to be able to withstand a bit of tugging on the wires here. I recommend using the slow speed. And then make sure the wires are parallel and clamp them to the workbench. And then all you need to do is to straighten the wires and go. So now I have a nice and tight twist. I now have the amp mostly assembled. I still need to hook up the inputs, as you can see, but I have all the other connections made. So before I obscure the view with the input connections, let me just walk you through how everything is connected here. So if you peek inside, you'll notice that the uh, mains inlet is mounted with the protective earth terminal facing up. That connects with a screen wire to the grounding lug at the bottom of the chassis. The terminal in the middle on the mains inlet is marked with an N for neutral. That is connected with this blue wire to this terminal also marked N. And then the live connection marked L is connected with this brown wire to the terminal marked L on the preamp power supply. On the power switch, the two brown wires here, they connect to the switch itself, to the two gold plated pins on the power switch and they connect to ground and the terminal mark power switch respectively. The red wire here is connected to the terminal on the switch that's marked R1.8V plus and that goes to the standby LED terminal here. The terminal that's marked G2.8V minus on the power switch is connected with a screen wire to the terminal here marked power LED or PWR LED. Then plus 12 volts comes from any of these three terminals, goes with these two red wires. One red wire connects to the evaluation board by TI, the other connects to J4 on the HP22 board. And similarly with the ground connections here with the black wires to the middle terminals on the HP22 board and the TI board. And then finally with the minus 12 volts, is on this blue wire here and the blue wire at the bottom connects to one of these three terminals. And now it's time to hook up the input. The amplifier is now basically complete. I have the left channel RCA connector wired to the left input of the HP22. The terminal that's closest to the board edge is ground and that goes to the solder lug on the RCA connector and the terminal that's closest to the inside of the board connected to this red wire here goes to the center pin and similarly for the right channel. So one thing here is that I have my Neurochrome HP load um, headphone amplifier dummy load connected to this or about to be connected to this amplifier. I'm obviously not expecting you to have one of these although I do sell them so you're more than welcome to buy one. And the reason I use this is I test headphone apps a lot and this HP load makes that super easy because it can uh, present any load from 12 ohms 
uh, in steps 12 ohms up to 600 ohms. It plugs directly into the control port on the audio precision distortion analyzer. So uh, that makes automated testing of headphone apps super easy. And it has a lot of other nice features. You can go read about it on my website. It's uh, under test equipment, it's called HP Load. But anyway, that's what that is. It's basically, at this point, considered a 300 ohm resistor. And um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not expecting you to have one of these, but I am expecting you to have like a multimeter, or at least having one is handy. Because I suggest that the first thing you check is the DC offset at the output of the amplifier. So let's do that. And let's start by plugging the amplifier in. And I have a handy dandy mains connection right here. I'm just gonna plug it in. Be careful where you put your fingers here. You don't wanna mess with the inside of that uh, mains jack. And plugged it in, no sparks, life is good. And I also get a red light on the front. So that is the standby indication. That's cool. So now I'm gonna turn it on. I push the button and the amp turns on. Now the LED is green. Yeah. So let's crank the volume all the way up and then let's make a quick measurement of the DC offset. So I'm just going to reach in here and find the right channel. Oh. The right channel shows a DC offset of around 20 microvolts. So that's pretty darn low. You're looking for something that's preferably below a millivolt. Um, if you don't clean the flux off the board, it might be a little higher. So I do recommend that once you're done assembling the HP22 circuit board, you know, clean the flux off. I have an article on my website and also a video on that. Um, so let's measure the left channel. That's also about 20 microvolts. So cool. There's no DC on the output. So I now, now feel comfortable. I would feel comfortable plugging in a pair of headphones at this point, um, but I prefer to run a sine wave through just to make sure that everything is clean and nice. Volume is all the way up. And let's turn on the source. Well, that's odd. Um, I had expected to have both the blue channel and the red channel going here. So that's a bit, um, this isn't working like it's supposed to do. Uh, specifically, the left channel doesn't produce any output. So, oops, <laughs> let's figure out why that might be. Um, so, like any cooking show, I've obviously done this before I started recording this particular segment. And it turns out that I have accidentally swapped the connections for the left channel, specifically left and ground are swapped on the output connector. So let me fix that. This time I have the amplifier output configured correctly. And let's just take a peek here at how I have it wired now. So the blue wire here is the ground that is connected to the terminal that's marked GR on the output jack. The green wire is the right channel output and that goes to the terminal marked RI for ring and the red is the left channel output and that goes to the tip which is marked tip on the output jack. Let's pop into the audio precision interface here one, once again. We'll notice that it seems like there's a bit of mains hum here and that's actually a setup issue. That's because the uh, input to the AP is floating. So let's ground that and just like that, the noise went away. We can see that with the volume cranked all the way up, we are looking at about three-ish microvolts RMS of output noise. That's pretty darn low. And let's turn the volume knob further down or all the way down. Now we're at 2.6 microvolts RMS. So this is unweighted uh, from 10 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. So that is very low. And as you can also see, when you turn the volume up, that additional bit of noise is actually the noise of the source in the audio precision analyzer that gets amplified by the amplifier. So this is almost as quiet as the AP, which is pretty impressive. So let's turn the source on, see if this works. And 
I have the amplitude set so that I get one volt or zero dB volt on the output. So what I like to do is to uh, change the amplitude on one of the channels. In this case, I'll change the left channel. This should result in the left channel output become lower. So we should see channel one go down if I change channel one here, and it does. So that's perfect. That means I have left connected to left uh, all the way through. You could also just simply unplug, say I'm unplugging the right channel here, so now the right channel goes away in the output as well. A very nice feature of the Neurochrome preamp power supply is the LED dimmers for the power switch LEDs. I at least prefer my LEDs to be pretty dim just so I'm not blinded by them when I sit in a darkened room and listen to music. So this is a bit too bright for my taste, so I'll just tweak the dimmer until the uh, indication is to my liking. So that's actually fairly easy. All you need to do is to tweak a potentiometer with a screwdriver. So let's do that. Currently I have on, power on indicated, so I need to turn the power uh, dimmer. Well, that looks pretty good. And then push the power button. Now I have standby indicated and I'll just dial that down a little bit. Maybe about like so. I prefer it to be almost barely on. So that's to my liking. If you like something else, just dial it in. It's all up to you. So now all that's left is to slide the top cover in, add the volume knob, and this amp is good to go. This is a very nice solid aluminum volume knob. It's made by a company called Motoshop out of Italy. And um, I quite like it. It's pretty heavy and it's also quite large. And I thought it would look pretty good on this amplifier. And a lot of people tend to like the large volume knobs anyway. The one thing you want to make sure of is that you turn the volume all the way to the minimum position and then align the set screw with the shaft of the potentiometer or that flat on the shaft. And what you'll find is that the volume knob can slide all the way to the front panel. If you just jam it in there and tighten the set screw, um, the knob will scratch the panel over time and that doesn't look so good. So I put a business card behind there and turn the set screw. I think I might have to push it in a little bit further. Like that. So, there you have it. One headphone amp. I also applied the stick-on feet that came with the chassis. So, that should be good for years of service. Enjoy.